If you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I thank the Lord for his faithfulness and you being faithful to God's word. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because we are now in chapter 12, uh, our first Sunday in chapter 12, finished up chapter 11 last week, looked on my computer. Uh, the first sermon in Romans, when we started Romans, was September the 18th, 2018. So next Sunday makes two years that we've been in the book of Romans, other than Christmases and some time in the summer and when I'm away. And I just thank the Lord for that, uh, that you're the kind of people who uh, have that expectation of me, and uh, it's a real blessing. And, and I thank the Lord for the opportunity to, to be able to preach God's word to you uh, by books. Most of you know uh, my typical pattern when I, when I start a brand new, a brand new book uh, is the years have gone by. If the book is small enough, uh, the very first Sunday that we begin is that I just read Galatians to you, all of it. I've read Galatians to you. I've read Ephesians to you. I've read Colossians to you. Uh, and if it's small enough, I didn't read the book of Revelation to you. Uh, I didn't read the book of John to you. I read the book of Ruth to you and other passages as well. But Romans is quite large. But I want to do today what is a favorite of mine, and that is read God's word to you more than just simply verses 1 and 2. And the reason why is because chapter 12 is, is now a shift. It's a change. In chapter 12, verse 1, uh, what Paul does is that he goes all the way through, and he doesn't end until what he's doing. He doesn't end until he gets to chapter 15, verse 13. So we thank God for the reading of his word. Chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 13. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your, I'll explain it in a moment, reasonable service, as the King James Version translates this. Reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be, be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, 
For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know the time, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it unclean. For if your brother is greed by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, 
to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and let the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises, arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Thank God for his word. This fall, I'm going to be offering a few brown bag luncheon discussions after worship to have fellowship with you and discuss whoever wants to meet me downstairs uh, to further discuss things that I just simply um, am not comfortable in saying in a public format like this. Uh, I'd rather say a few things and have dialogue with you uh, when we get to the, the latter end of chapter 12 and chapter 13 and 14. Uh, so uh, be looking forward to that. I look forward to having uh, lunch with you and discussing in further detail um, things that are in, this, in these chapters. And I'll be bringing two books with me. Uh, one book written by Chuck Colson and Nancy Piercy. It's about that thick, how now should we then live? Nancy Piercy uh, is, a, is, a, is a great writer, a godly woman. Uh, she's a graduate of a Covenant Theological Seminary and uh, has done inc incredible work. And the other book um, um, by Wayne Grudem, it's called Politics According to the Bible. And it's even thicker. <laughs> Uh, and he touches on every single subject uh, that we live with, and uh, with Bibles open, let's go to God's Word and see how to address some very important things uh, that, uh, that are before us. And the reason why I want to do that is because, as we're going to see today briefly, this section of Romans, this entire section, chapter 12, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 13, this entire section of Romans is one of the most used portions uh, of Scripture to build what is called a Christ-centered worldview or a biblical worldview or a Christian uh, worldview. That is to say, a worldview that begins in the mind and is lived out in the world. Do you remember Romans chapter 1, verse 28? I'll cite it for you. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God... God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. And here we have Paul in chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And he says that because I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God... By the mercies of God. When you become a Christian, you don't stop thinking in a worldly, secular way. Not overnight. You don't. You can still live years as a Christian. In fact, maybe even your entire life. And still, you have areas in your mind you think like a secular, worldly person. I do. We all do. And Paul has spent 11 chapters working on the great truths of what God has done for us in Christ. And now he pleads by the mercies of God to present 
our bodies, our very bodies, and our minds as a living sacrifice. And one of the challenges that the Roman believers had is the same challenge that we still have this day and all believers, and that is this. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that you think right. You don't. We don't. And as the years go by, by God's mercies, we begin to think the way Christ thinks about things. In other words, we begin to develop a biblical worldview, a biblical Christ-centered worldview. And there's always been things that are opposite, that oppose a biblical worldview. And one of the ways that we can learn about that and hear that and describe that is like this, competing worldviews. Like moral relativism, it leans heavily upon nature. And that is to say that nature is all that there is. It's just what's tangible, what you can see, smell, hear, and touch and taste. If that's all that there is, then there is no transcendent source of moral truth. And that is true. I encounter this every single week with these truck drivers. They do not, many of them do not believe that there's any true God. And if there is a true God, he hasn't communicated to us. And that means that every principle is reduced to a personal preference. If that mechanic does not believe in a true personal God, he's a moral relativist, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me stealing his tools. Right? Well... There's consequences to being a moral relativist, to personal preference. But for the Christian, he or she believes God has spoken and spoken principally in the life of Jesus, his son. And therefore, there is an unchanging standard of right and wrong, an unchanging standard of right and wrong. Multiculturalism. If there's no source of real truth and all is relative then we find our identity only in our gender and ethnicity. And the behaviors that our tribe adopts is to be without judgment. My treehouse, my rules. But the Christian can judge a particular cultural practice as right or wrong according to God's word and defend a cultural heritage to the degree that it is shaped by Scripture. Pragmatism. If there's no source of real truth and all is relative, then whatever works best is right. But the Christian must still judge based not on what works best, but on what is right according to Scripture. Utopianism. Oh, if only we can create the right social and economic structures, we can usher in an age of harmony and prosperity. But the Christian believes that sin is real and that none of our efforts can create heaven on earth. There's not a single policy that we can legislate that's going to bring heaven to earth. Heaven on earth is a future hope for the Christian upon the return of Christ. The human propensity to evil must be opposed, therefore, chapter 13, by law and by cultural disapproval, of which there is almost none left. Because as Francis Schaeffer said, the Christian consensus is now gone in our culture. It's a weird way of saying it, but I just got to say it this way. Idolatry of creation, which is Romans 1, And this is the view of life that only cares about what happens in this world, this age, this life, my life. But the Christian sees further. Not only is there a new heaven and new earth coming, there is also a judgment coming that will reveal the secrets and motives of the hearts. You could summarize the last 60 years in America with two words. We'll first begin with existentialism. This is what swept across America in the 1960s on college campuses. All of life, your life, my life, has no meaning. Life is absurd. 
which gave way to free choice to make whatever decision seems best to you at any given moment, because it doesn't matter. All that matters is what I want to do or what I don't want to do. This is what gave footing for Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood in the early, late 60s and then finally in 73, to make sure that if you don't want to be a parent, you can terminate the life of a baby. It's what gave footing for Paul Simon's The Sound of Silence in 1964. Hello, darkness, my old friend. The year that I was born, hello, darkness, my old friend. Paul Simon wrote that song in February of 1964 for this reason, in his own words. He wrote the, I wrote this song about the emotional inability for people to love each other these days. The emotional inability for people to love each other these days. Later on, as I learned to play on the guitar, Pink Floyd, you're just another brick in the wall. I was a sophomore in high school. And I learned to play that one. You're just another brick in the wall. Teacher, we don't need no education. This is existentialism. Kansas, all we are is dust in the wind. Life has no meaning. Life is absurd. So I'll just do whatever I want, when I want. In other words, like the book of Judges. We're all doing what's right in our own eyes. And don't judge me. We still have that, but now what is mostly called postmodernism. So no, no, it's worldviews. It's how people think. They don't know these terms. That doesn't matter. You can find this stuff across the, the lawn, at work, everywhere. It's in your family. Postmodernism, which rejects any kind of Christian consensus to guide culture. Today it's now called the cancel culture. And it is met with punishment. Any kind of Christian consensus to guide culture is met with punishment and will not be tolerated, of course, all in the name of tolerance. It reduces all ideas to social constructs shaped by class, gender, and ethnicity. But the Christian, the Christian sees that man is made in the image of God. And there's only two genders. Male and female. There's only two. And there's only one kind of sex that's permitted and blessed of the Lord. And it's between a married man and woman. Say that in culture today, in this woke culture, and the hammer will come down on you. So we see that man is made in the image of God, and therefore, not only are we bound by certain rights, but also we have responsibility and duty to our fellow man, and duty to our government. In postmodernism, which is the entire atmosphere of the education system in America, and getting worse, all viewpoints, all lifestyles, all beliefs and behaviors are regarded as equally valid, except... Anything that even smells or even hints of a Christian consensus. Tolerance has become so important that no exception will be tolerated. Ivan, this sounds like a philosophy class more than worship. Perhaps. But we need to understand something, folks, as we move in this section of Romans. Everyone is a philosopher, and everyone is a worshiper. Everyone. Why? Because everyone has a view of how the world ought to function, how people should live their lives, how governments ought to work, how relationships should engage differences of opinions. And everyone is a worshiper because everyone is hoping, trusting, believing, investing in something or someone. Everyone is a philosopher and a worshiper at the same time. And either you're a biblical one or you're not. So, when the Apostle Paul says to not be conformed to this world, he is saying that you Roman believers up in Rome... 
you believers at Grace Community Church, you are not to build your philosophy, your worldview upon how the world sees things, but rather you need to be transformed. And the only way you're going to do that is to be is to get your mind back in God's word and have your mind renewed. It needs to be renewed. So just because you're a Christian doesn't mean that you think biblically. Just like the Roman believers. They're still, they've been living their life as pagans up in Rome. And the culture has affected them. And they didn't get up the next morning and begin to think biblically about government. Biblically about life. Biblically about relationships. Biblically about all kinds of things. And neither did you and I. And if that's the case, then we don't live our lives based upon the mercies of God, chapter 12, verse 1, to live out a sacrificial life because there's a, there's a consequential effect going on here. I'm being appealed to, you're being appealed to by the mercies of God. So I want to just share with you four things that, that's going to really shape chapter 12, verse 1, all the way through chapter 15, verse 13. And then I'm going to end with uh, two helpful comments. William James Durant was an American writer, historian, and philosopher, not a believer. Uh, He became best known for his work called The Story of Civilization, in which he co-wrote with his wife, Ariel, 11 volumes, and they were published from 1935 to 1975. One of his most famous quotes out of all 11 volumes is this. From barbarism to civilization requires a century. From civilization to barbarism needs but a day. And that's not only true of society but the personal life as well. Oh, how hard and long it takes to build a life that has integrity and honor. But how easy and fast it is to throw it all away. So today, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, reasonable worship. Let's work on a couple things briefly. Number one, a merciful living sacrifice for others. See, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, yes, to God, and then starting at verse 3, it's to others, and to others, and to others, and even your enemy, and to the government, and to people that you have differences of opinion with, people in the church and people outside the church, impacting all kinds of things into your life. Even areas that you don't get justice in this life. Can I go out and get um, justice in this life if you do me wrong? No. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Am I permitted to resist the government? No. You resist God, you resist the government, you resist God. All these things have an impact upon how you live your life. And how easy it is to lose civilization, civility, and plunge into barbarism overnight. And unfortunately, I'm not even sure if the church is ready for what I think is coming. And I don't want to get caught up in it. I want to have a Christian worldview and maintain integrity all the way through. Don't you? Don't you? All the way through. No matter what's coming down the road in this country, hard things are coming. Hard things. But a merciful living sacrifice, merciful living sacrifice for others. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Paul has spent the preceding 11 chapters explaining why God created the world, why he created ethnicities, why he created the whole structure of humanity, why humanity is broken, and what is the answer to what is broken. 
but it's amazing that Paul would use mercies to describe, in summary, all of God's ways throughout those 11 chapters. Why would he do it that way? Why do we just, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Therefore, the 11 chapters, therefore, I'm appealing to you by the mercies of God. And mercies of God is just, just a, a caption of what Paul understands of all God has done for us in these first 11 chapters. And the reason why he's doing this is because, as we'll see throughout this section of Romans, is that the life that we are being called to is a life of mercy. Since God was and is merciful to you, your life is to be offered up as a merciful, undeserved sacrifice to God and your fellow man. Look at verse 9. Let love be genuine and abhor what is evil. Why? Because God is merciful. Don't forget those 11 chapters. Hold fast to what is good. Why? Because God is merciful. Love one another with brotherly affection. Why? Because God is merciful. You can take every single one of these verbs, say it, put the question, why? Back to chapter 12, verse 1. Because God has been merciful to you. And you now are being called to live a merciful life to others. A merciful life to others. Secondly, which is not in your sermon outline, and I discovered after I printed that outline, number two, which you don't have there, it's missing. There's four things here. God accepts your offering, your life offering, because of his mercies. To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, here it comes, holy and acceptable to God. There it is. God accepts your offering, which is your life, because of his mercies. Your life, your, your life offering is holy and acceptable to God. That's great news. Um... I'm glad you gave that testimony, Scott. Uh, You had a lousy night. You had a lousy morning. You don't deserve to be here. And yet you're acceptable. This morning, God is saying, I accept you. And you failed. And I accept you. Based on what? On the mercies of God. Did he not die for you while we were still sinners? And what do you think is holding God back from accepting you just because you had a lousy night or a lousy morning? I know for a fact there are people in this church, and you do it routinely, you don't come to church on Sunday morning because you feel so poorly about yourself. As if God feels poorly about you. No, it's not mutual. He sent his son for you when you were a rebel. He's used to not being liked. (laughs) He's used to being dishonored. This is how merciful he is. And it's to impact and shape the way I think about my own life and the way I think about you. Thirdly, your merciful life is reasonable service. At the end of verse 1, which is your, and I'm reading out of the ESV, which is your spiritual worship. It really bothered me when the ESV came out with that. Doggone it, guys. You know better than that. But I know why they translated this word logicon. I'll transliterate it for you. L-O-G-I-K. What's that sound like? Logic. Logicon. L-O-G-I-K-A-N. It's the word that's translated spiritual, it's, or in the King James Version, reasonable, or rational, or logical. I think the reason why the ESV translated this word spiritual is because of the, the sacrificial language of the verse. Of course, it's not literally being sacrificed. I'm not on an altar and burning under a fire, but as a metaphor... It's a spiritual offering, which I I would agree. Uh, But I'm still sticking with the King James and the New American Standard and the RSV. I think the right translation is reasonable service. 
And that's simply going to be this. It is right. It is logical. It is reasonable. It is rational. Given the fact that God has been so merciful to you and would give you mercies all the days of your life, that you would offer your life up to him and to others. It's reasonable. And finally, I want to say this. We'll see this all the way through this section of Romans. Your worldview is to prove that God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. The latter part, well, actually all of verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Get a biblical worldview that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we're going to be looking at that that throughout this section. So I want to end our time today just giving you two, two things now. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, are to be thankful to God for a solid foundation to build your life upon. This is a solid foundation to build your life upon. Remember, I've used these terms in the past. Indicative and imperative. Only Christianity talks like this. Only Christianity. I've studied Hinduism, Buddhism, Christian science, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, lots of world worldviews, world religions. Only Christianity does this. What? The first 11 chapters, the indicative. What is true about God and what he's done for you in Christ? Truth, 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 truth. Brick after brick after brick, after brick, after brick, after brick, brick, more bricks, more bricks, more bricks. Solid, 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 solid foundation. And now because of that, I appeal to you by the mercies of God. Now give your life the imperatives. And there's dozens and dozens and dozens of them that we just read. All the way to chapter 15, verse 13. Build your life. We get to build our lives upon the mercies of God, the indicative. Which means God is not calling me to do something that he's now already equipped me to do. And you as well. You know, if you ask God, why should I live my life for you? He would not respond the way many of us did respond to our teens. And that's okay. Because I said so. Why should I do it? Because I said so. Now, I did explain a lot. Cheryl and I did. I did. When our children were young. But then when they became teenagers, I tried to explain it and it wouldn't help them. They never went. My teenagers never once went, oh, why? Wow, Dad, you're so wise. Thank you for answering my question. I never got that, not once. I still don't. So I just went back to it because I said so. Because it doesn't matter. You're not going to believe or accept anything that I say anyway, so just do it. I'm so thankful that when we ask God, why should I give my life as a living sacrifice? God says, I'll tell you why. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Let's do this again. And he gives me reason after reason after reason after reason after reason after reason after reason. We thank God for a solid foundation to build your life upon. He's making us into the image of Christ. Remember chapter 8, to conform us to the image of Christ. And secondly, I leave this with you. And then our... Then the work begins next week. Your life is vertical to God first, then horizontal to man. Look at chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And these two verses do act as a, they function as a thesis statement, as an overarching thesis statement. And then the rest, all the way to chapter 15, verse 13, is all about these two verses. But to God first, at the end of verse 1, holy and acceptable to God See, it's to God. It's it's vertical first. Your life is vertical, which is your reasonable service or worship. And then now horizontal. Therefore, now now stop stop thinking like the world thinks. Stop thinking the way that, that you've been thinking. You're in Christ now. And horizontally to the world, stop thinking like the way they think. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. So when God's will is discovered in your life, I can't wait to talk to you about that. What is God's will? 
you'll discover that it is good, that it is acceptable, and that it's spot on perfect. I need that in trying hours and days, knowing that whatever it means, and we discover what it means to live our lives merciful to others, is that God is merciful to you all the days of your life. So, folks, here comes a lot of imperatives, and we've got a lot of things to apply, and we've got a lot of things that we need, we need to submit our minds to so that we can be renewed in our mind and think the way the Lord thinks, and then apply it to our lives. So may the Lord bless us in, in weeks and months to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this, this, this new section of, of this letter to the Romans. Uh, by design, Lord, you moved the Apostle Paul to just lay brick after brick after brick of solid, great, wonderful truths. Not that he didn't have a few verbs now and then and by implication in those brick-laying uh, days of writing. But now, Lord, uh, you've turned his heart. You've turned his heart to now speak to the church and, and what it means to go out now and live our lives at home, at work on vacation, wherever. Uh, so, Lord, um, open our eyes and give us exactly what we need uh, in the Sundays to come as we spend time in this portion of your word. We praise you and thank you for it because it was merciful to you that you even gave us your word. We don't even deserve this. Uh, so, Lord, thank you. Now, Lord, um, give us a wonderful afternoon, good food and time with family and friends and rest. In your name we pray. Amen.